Okay, hopefully now you have a handle on the descriptive statistics. And what we want to think about now is that only describes our data set. So we had 47 people in our study. Who cares? I don't care about those 47 people. What I really want to do now is make decisions and inferences. I want to infer based on what we know about you guys, what does that tell us about everybody else? And of course, everybody else is who I think you, uh, the population you represent. Now, I may be studying something that's very general, so even though I grabbed 47 intro psych students from UT, I still think this is a pretty general phenomenon that we're you know, gonna find in most people, um, or most Americans, or Northwesterners, or, you know, or universally. It, it just sort of depends on what I'm studying. All right, so let me bring up our slides again, and we'll get our slideshow going. Okay. So the question now is, so what? So you have this data set, big deal. You've described it. You've told me something about the scores and how they vary within your data set. What's that going to tell me, though? Um, because they just, descriptive statistics describe what we have. Um, but, again, I don't care about them. I want to know about everyone else. You don't, you know, hear a study on the radio going, oh, we learned something about 30 people. You say, hey, people tend to do this because that's what we inferred based on this data. Um, and that's also why when you hear some kind of scientific study, you go, well, that doesn't describe me. I wonder who these people were that they got and how are they different from me and would that stuff really apply to the rest of us? Uh, external validity is the question for that. All right, so we move on to inferential statistics and they let us infer. They take what we know about the, the sample in our study and let us infer something, logically draw some conclusions about the population or other people. All right, so just remember, inferential statistics infer, descriptive describe. Now there are loads and loads of different kinds of inferential statistical tests. You're gonna come across things like t-tests, ANOVA, so that's analysis of variance, correlations, chi-square, all of these words, all these different tests. Now the good thing is for, for now, if you're a freshman or sophomore, at this point, you don't really need to know a whole lot about the difference between these, but you do need to know they're all um, inferential statistics, so they let us draw conclusions. Um, now, they're all probability-based, and I guess we'll, we'll kind of come back to what this means. Um, but the good thing is while t-tests give us a t-score, analysis of variance gives us an f-score, a chi-square gives us a chi-square uh, score, this little x. Um, we get correlation coefficients. So they, all these tests will spit out this statistics, this, this number. But you don't have to really worry about that number. In fact, in your um, anatomy of an article assignment, some of you, you know, it said like, what were the stats they used? And I just wanted you to look in there and see if you could pick out some names. And a couple of those articles had stuff that I hadn't even really heard of. I'm like, what's this? But you were able to go, oh, here's a title of a test. They did something. And it's okay if this seems like, I don't know what this stuff is right now, because every single test, inferential test, in the kind of statistics we do, which are based on probabilities, will spit out their statistic, their F score, whatever it is, but they will also spit out a P value. All of the tests will give you a P value. And we're excited because we do want to understand what P values mean. So you really have to understand one number is what I want you to understand for this class. Um, and this one number is going to tell us what conclusion we should draw. All right, so here's the thing. When you're running an experiment, you essentially have um, a decision you have to make. You have a hypothesis. You go, I think this independent variable is going to change you, and I'm going to measure that change in the dependent variable. So I think these two things are causally connected. Or I run a correlation. I say, I think these variables have an association. I think there'll be a predictable relationship there. So that's my hypothesis. Technically, it's called the alternative hypothesis, but you'll probably never see that, or you'll see in the research hypothesis. They just say, here's my hypothesis. This is how I think it's working. Now, at the end, I'd run my study, I collect my data, and at the end, I have to decide, am I right? Do, is, do the data support my hypothesis, and I, I really think it works this way? Or there's another choice at the end, is there nothing going on here? I'm, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, like these things are not related, there's no cause and effect, nothing happened. So essentially when I design a study, I'm saying, I think this is what's gonna happen, something's happening here. 
but there's also the the possibility that nothing's happening there's not these things are not connected that's called the null hypothesis n-u-l-l so I get my data, and what the statistics tell me, and the p-value in particular, and it tells me which way to go. Should I say something's happening or nothing's happening? And it actually gives me a probability of being wrong if I go with the one, I, the one that says something's happening. The p-value tells me, what's the chance you're wrong if you choose the something happened decision as opposed to the nothing happened decision? Uh, let's get our slides back and see what I, the heck I'm talking about. So, come here, p-value. P stands for probability, but basically the probability that you're going to be wrong if you say, it worked. My hypothesis is, is looking good. All right, there's a lot of words. So, p-value gives you the probability that the results you got in your study were due to chance, as opposed to being what you hoped it would be, what you thought it might be. Now, due to chance, that's the null. And here's the thing, when you have two groups, it, for anything and you measure something even if they're not significantly different they're probably not going to give you the exact same numbers that's the random error the individual variation so you can have little group differences you know averages or means that are different from each other it doesn't mean they're statistically significant and the p-value tells you what's the chance you'll get this difference that you measure between your groups simply from chance just from random variation just from the fact that people give you number different numbers no matter what's happening as opposed to what you thought was going on so when we say p less than 0.05 that's a pretty standard like if my p value is less than 0.05 what that means is 0.05 that's 5% it's saying there's a less than 5% chance that the results i'm looking at here the difference between my groups is just random error individual variation and as a researcher I, I go you know if it's that's a pretty small probability that nothing's happening so I'm gonna say the data support my hypothesis now I never say prove or I never say it's absolutely shown to be proven that never happens because look there's a 5% chance I'm wrong in my hypothesis and saying hey something's going on here Another way to look at this is, let's say I run a study. Um, we're doing the pasta bowl thing. You Half the people are randomly selected to have pasta served in a big bowl. The other half randomly get a smaller or medium bowl. And I measure how much they take, and I see a difference. Now, there's different reasons why people might have taken more or less besides the fact of this bowl. You know, they were hungrier, um, whatever it is. You know, all these other things that make them take more or less. But I run my data, and, and the statistics say, you know what? The probability that people, you know, took more or less based on something else and not your independent variable, which was size of the bowl, is a 5% chance that, that, that you'd see that. So I ran that study once. What if I ran that study 99 more times and grabbed new samples each time from my population? Okay, you 30 people were in my study. I got my data. Go away. Now I'm going to grab 30 more people and run it again Ooh, and see what the results like. Basically, if I do that study 100 times, I could expect that five times out of 100, I'm going to get the data I got just simply based on random error, chance variation. And as a researcher, I say those are pretty good odds. Those are really low. I think I'm, I'm feeling confident enough to say I'm going to reject my null hypothesis. You know, the null hypothesis is nothing happened. And I want to reject that. I want to say, mm, not feeling it and I support my original. So when the risk is that small of being wrong and rejecting my null, I go ahead and say, yeah, I think it worked. I think the IV really is having an effect, and the data support that decision. They don't prove it, because I could be wrong. There's a little chance I'm wrong, but they're certainly consistent with my hypothesis. That's what I'm looking for. Um, all right, so let's look at the alpha. Sorry, the slide all came up at once, but alpha is basically, in you see that little, what is that? Oh, it's the alpha sign, <laughs> okay, from the Greek thing. It shouldn't have that little comma over it, but I couldn't find the alpha without the little comma. So alpha is a little alpha sign, fish looking thing. It's what you have to, you have to decide ahead of time, how small does the p-value have to be for you to reject your null at the end of the experiment, okay? Now, often people don't say in their papers what their alpha is. And if they don't say, you just assume it was 0.05, because that's just a, it's, it's just a tradition. It's a habit. People like that. 
5% one. Now, there might be very good reasons, though, to have a smaller alpha or a bigger alpha. Um, and, and once alpha is set, you, you set it ahead of time. You go, then you run your stats. And if it's less than or equal to, but that like hardly, that would never happen. Um, if it's P is less than alpha, you go ahead and reject your null. Okay. Now look at those alphas of 0.01 or 0.001. And there's the answer to your question on the slide already. As I make alpha smaller, I basically say uh, 0.01 would be a 1% chance. That's saying I'm only going to reject my null if there's only a 1% chance I could get these results I see when nothing's going on. 001, one in a thousand. I'm being really conservative and careful. I'm only going to reject my null if I get a p-value that tells me there's less than one in 1,000 chance you would get this data you're looking at, this difference you see, if nothing was going on and it was just chance current. So feeling pretty good that something's going on there and you can support your actual research hypothesis. Okay, so the smaller alpha is, the harder it is to reject your null. And you have to have some real, a big effect, right? If the effect size is big, that means your groups are really even, you know, your IV really had an impact. Your data from your two groups is looking really different. You're going to get tiny p-values, which is awesome. You want small p-values because that's the probability that this is just noise and nothing. It's really small. So I love small p-values. Okay. Now, you know, there could be some exploratory research where you're like, I don't want to be this hard. I think there's something going on. You could at raise alpha. You could say, I'm, I'll take a p-value that's less than 0.1, 10% chance. It's kind of rare, but there are situations when people would do that. Okay, at this point, I think you go ahead, look at those. It's just like four pages in the appendices, maybe five, on inferential statistics. Look at it. It's got the logic of the statistics. It's good reading. It's everything I would say in a longer video if I wanted to make you watch a longer video, but I don't. Um, read that, then do the worksheet, the second stats worksheet, and then start taking your quiz again and, and see how you do, and we're going to get a handle on the stuff. Awesome. Thanks, guys.